Did you know that certain physics concepts can actually help us build the next generation of AI models? We are living in the era of artificial intelligence, an era in which large language models have become foundational technologies. They are embedded in everyday life, assisting millions of people on a daily basis. As these systems increasingly mediate human productivity and communication, their reliability, robustness, and transparency are no longer abstract academic concerns. They are practical necessities with direct societal impact. Decisions influenced by AI now affect education, healthcare, finance, law, and governance. When an AI system fails, the consequences can propagate far beyond a single user interaction. At the same time, current large language models expose fundamental limitations rooted in how they are trained and optimized. Hallucinations, brittleness to small perturbations, vulnerability to adversarial prompts, and opaque internal decision-making are not isolated flaws or implementation bugs. They are symptoms of deeper structural issues. In the next generation of AI models, these issues must be elevated from afterthoughts to first-class design principles. But that raises an important question. What exactly do we mean by next-generation AI models? By next-generation AI models, we do not mean throwing everything away and starting from scratch. Instead, we have something very similar to the correspondence principle in physics in mind. The correspondence principle, originally formulated by Nobel laureate Niels Bohr, states that the predictions of a new physical theory must reproduce those of an older, well-established theory in the domain where the older theory is known to work. Translating this idea to AI, Next-generation AI models should fall back to current models when their behavior is well-understood and well-behaved. They should retain the impressive capabilities we already have. However, the problems that plague current systems should be systematically removed or rendered unstable in some principled way. But how are the existing problems of AI models related to physics? And how can physics concepts help us fix those issues? If you are interested in knowing the answers to these questions, stay tuned. Did you know that every machine learning model, from simple regression to image generating models like DAL-E, can be explained by a single elegant equation? If you're interested in learning machine learning in a unified way, visit our webpage at compuflare.com. This is a unique place to understand every machine learning model through one elegant equation from a physics-inspired perspective. In addition to the courses, we offer end-to-end -end intermediate and advanced projects that develop your skills, experience, and online presence, helping you land top industry roles. Visit CompuFlare.com and start building your data science career. Before we discuss how physics can help fix the issues of current AI models, let us briefly enumerate the problems themselves. One of the most widely discussed issues is that large language models can hallucinate. They often produce fluent, confident, and persuasive outputs that are factually incorrect. This behavior undermines trust and makes it difficult to rely on these systems in high-stakes settings. Another issue is that these models are brittle to prompt perturbations. Small, seemingly irrelevant changes in wording can lead to drastically different answers. A harmless rephrasing of a question can cause the model to contradict itself or abandon a previously correct line of reasoning. This unpredictability makes systematic evaluation and control extremely difficult. In addition, current models are vulnerable to adversarial attacks. Carefully designed inputs can bypass safety mechanisms, trigger unintended behaviors, or elicit outputs that violate usage policies. These vulnerabilities are not merely superficial. They reveal that the model's internal structure contains unstable regions that can be exploited. The question now is how all of this is related to physics. The key insight is that each one of these negative outcomes corresponds to a minimum of the effective free energy of the AI model. These behaviors are not random accidents. They are stable, high-probability configurations of the system. To clarify what I mean by this, we need to pause for a moment and examine the relationship between AI outcomes and their free energy landscape. As we have explained several times on this channel, physics and machine learning models both admit probabilistic descriptions of events. At a mathematical level, they share the same formal structure. If you strip away the interpretation of the variables, 
It can be impossible to tell whether an equation is describing a physical system or an AI model. In both physics and AI, probability often takes the following form. In this equation, Z is a normalization constant and F is the effective free energy. It is a function defined over a high dimensional space of states. Crucially, the function F usually has multiple minima. These minima correspond to regions where the probability is exponentially larger than elsewhere. In practical terms, these are the outputs or behaviors of the model that are astronomically more likely to occur. We can associate both good and bad behaviors of an AI model with these minima. A coherent, correct answer corresponds to one minimum. A hallucinated but fluent response corresponds to another. A jailbreak or adversarial response corresponds to yet another minimum. The problem is not that these bad behaviors exist at all. The problem is that they are stable minima in the free energy landscape. Once the system falls into one of these basins, it tends to stay there. What we need to do is identify which minima correspond to undesirable behaviors and then modify or remove them from the free energy landscape. In other words, we need to reshape the landscape itself. This perspective reframes AI safety and alignment as a problem of landscape engineering rather than behavior suppression. Instead of trying to detect and block bad outputs after they occur, we explicitly shape which collective states are stable and which are forbidden. But how exactly should we figure out the free energy landscape of an AI model? In a previous video, we showed how one can use the chain rule of probability to construct the free energy landscape of a fully connected neural network. The idea was to merge the probabilities of individual neurons layer by layer, eventually obtaining a global probability distribution. However, can we realistically apply that method to more complicated AI models? This question becomes even more challenging when we consider that the models behind systems like ChatGPT or Google's Gemini are extraordinarily complex. They contain billions of parameters, intricate attention mechanisms, and deep hierarchical structures. Attempting to explicitly merge the probabilities of all their internal components quickly becomes intractable. In such cases, the chain rule approach appears naive. So what is the solution? To answer that, we need to change our perspective entirely. So, let's dive in. The approach I am going to discuss in the rest of this video is inspired by how Landau tackled the problem of phase transitions in physics. Landau realized that one does not need to track every microscopic degree of freedom to understand macroscopic behavior. Instead of a bottom-up approach, he proposed a top-down approach based on the behavior of the system. We adopt the same philosophy here. Instead of trying to merge the probabilities of individual components of an AI model, we infer the probability by observing how the model behaves as a whole. This approach is largely independent of the internal structure of the AI model. To make the method more concrete, however, let us consider a simplified example. Assume we are classifying thousands of handwritten images using a fully connected neural network. Unlike in the previous video, we want to learn the free energy landscape using a top-down approach. That means we deliberately pretend that we do not know how many hidden layers or hidden neurons the model has. We assume that the probability of the AI model under study is given by the following equation. Since we are taking a top-down approach, we assume that the free energy F is only a function of the input layer, which consists of the pixels of the images, and the output layer, which consists of 10 neurons corresponding to the 10-digit classes. We use X to refer to the neurons of the input layer and Y to refer to the neurons of the output layer. We then construct a spreadsheet whose columns represent the pixels of the input images as well as the states of the 10 output neurons. Each row of this spreadsheet represents one observation, which is a vector in a high-dimensional space whose dimensionality is equal to the number of columns. At this point, we rely on the fact that there are well-established methods for inferring probability distributions by observing how data points are scattered in high-dimensional spaces. For very complex cases, we might use advanced techniques such as diffusion models. However, due to the relative simplicity of this example, we use a kernel density estimator to infer the effective free energy F from how the training data points are distributed. 
This gives us the joint probability of observing a particular pair of input image and output neuron configuration. What we are really interested in, however, is the probability of the output neurons given an input image. In other words, we want the conditional probability expressed as follows. Here, Z sub C is another normalization constant, but the free energy F is the same as before. We already use the kernel density estimator to compute the joint probability in numerator. To compute the marginal probability in denominator, we again apply the kernel density estimator, but this time only to the columns representing the input images. We exclude the 10 output columns and estimate the marginal probability of the inputs alone. The effective free energy is then obtained as a simple logarithm of the conditional probability. Finally, we use the microscope that we introduced and used in previous videos on this channel to visualize the high-dimensional free energy landscape. The white markers indicate minima that are at least 99% as deep as the global minimum, which is indicated by a red marker. Each of these global minima corresponds to one possible behavior or output of the model. In the next videos, we will investigate methods for assigning specific behaviors to specific minima and for reshaping the landscape itself. I hope you have enjoyed this video. Until the next one, take good care of yourself.